thanks everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Svonko Kaiser. I'm with NVIDIA in the Cloud Native team. Um, my main responsibilities are Kata and Confidential Containers. And today I want to talk about a topic from silicon to service, the full stack ensuring confidentiality in serverless GPU cloud functions. So who has been in uh, KubeCon EU in Paris may have seen my talk on confidentiality confidential containers with GPU and REC LLMs. So just to recap what we've done in the space, right? Uh, I talked about the road to confidential computing, what we've done in the space, uh, why we've chosen Kata for, for implementing confidential compute with the GPUs on Kubernetes. Uh, explained a little bit about the GPU enablement stack, uh, the virtualization reference architecture, uh, what we need to take care about um, to enable advanced use cases like GPU Direct RDMA or GDS. Uh, how we implemented confidential containers, and then as an example, uh, how we can run regular LMs with confidential containers. Um, I linked the recording, so if anybody interested on the low-level details, what I've done in this space, uh, go check it out. Um, today, I want to expand on the use cases that we are doing with confidential containers and uh, role of the working groups that we established in the upstream community. So. One of the working groups is our confidential containers use case working group. Um, different companies from IBM, Red Hat, uh, NVIDIA, uh, Intel, IMD are involved in all of this. And we identified three major use cases that we want to enable and push forward upstream. Uh, number one is federated learning, uh, which includes um, a data clean room. So we have different peers and integration server working in one confidential environment, so we need to share this environment and provide a data clean room for multiple personas, uh, which also ties into multi-party computing, right? It's not only a single node where we're running a confidential container, it's multiple nodes, and we need to take care, care of that. Um, the other big topic is, of course, if you're running a confidential environment, everything needs to be trusted, be it your build pipeline, your CI CD pipeline. So we have several members of our community there working on the supply chain security, right? Uh, all things related to S-bombs, provenance, uh, CICD, and repeatability of, of builds, and at the station of builds and uh, deliverables that we are having in the enclave or a confidential environment. Uh, and of course, generative AI, REC, LLMs, NIMS, um, how to properly deploy them, how to properly secure them. Um, so essentially, all of those use cases are one thing in common. We have different parties running in the enclave, and it we need to make sure that we are providing a clean room, a confidential clean room for all of those parties involved. Um, I linked also uh, a document of the upstream community so you can read up on those use cases with some slides and presentation about that. Um, anybody working in a confidential computing use case knows the REDS architecture. So we have a dedicated um, working group that is mainly focused on attestation. Uh, Trusty is our attestation pipeline in confidential containers. Um, currently, most of the confidential environments are kind of concentrated on, on one node and doing the attestation at the beginning of the, of the run. But you have workloads that are running maybe for weeks or for months. And uh, one thing we are looking into it is doing things like periodic attestation runs. So if you have a lot of nodes coming in and coming out, all those attestation entities needs to be uh, attested and verified. And also, we want to um, disable replay attacks. For example, if you have a confidential storage, you want to may have a periodic run to verify that your confidential storage is still in the state that you're expecting it. Um, and then as I said before, we have multiple persona support. Imagine a, a cloud provider is providing the infrastructure then you have the model owner who is providing the third party model, and then you have the, the user who is maybe having X-ray images uh, using this model. And every of those personas needs to be attested against each other and uh, needs to be verified. Um, so this is also a big topic in, in our trusty working group, how to accomplish this. Uh, and then we have things like composite attestation support. So if you imagine you have a lot of attestation entities coming in and out of your confidential environment, um, you want to make sure that you're not getting any race uh, conditions and that um, those attestation of those entities um, are being done in a proper manner and it, in the right time. Because there are some timing attacks, especially on the hardware level, where you have different policies and attestation runs. So what we are thinking is how we can composite 
uh, all those attestation entities maybe in one report, or are we doing like a round robin attestation runs and stuff like that. So those, those are the questions that we try to answer um, and how to do it properly. Uh, and then of course, another big topic is runtime integrity. Um, systems can change during the runtime and we wanna catch that. And if everything breaks, we wanna have uh, a signal or some alert that something has changed. Um, as I said before, most of the environments are single node. Um, we need also to care, take care about a global state at a station. So the global state about multiple nodes, multiple clusters, or maybe even multiple availability zones, right? So you have a global state and you need to attest your complete global state. And of course, identity management, you need to know who is coming in into your secure enclave and who is coming out. So you always need a proper identity uh, of your hardware devices, of your peers, of your nodes, of your everything that's coming in and coming out of your uh, secure enclave. And really the, the main focus for, of confidential containers is like the lift and shift strategy that we have, right? Run your code without any modifications. So uh, we have support for the major hardware TEs, be it SMP, TDX, ARM CCA, uh, RISC-V COVID is coming and IBM SE. Uh, we can run on any infrastructure, be it on-prem CSP or, or hybrid. And, and re on also any model of deployment, be it serverless or managed Kubernetes, uh, we are trying to enable all of those use cases uh, with, with confidential containers, meaning a pretty good lift and shift strategy so that you can run your container as a traditional container, as a Kata container, or if you wish, as a confidential container. All the work before that we've seen with CMEMs is, or confidential VMs or TEs or enclaves is making those enclaves more secure. But one thing we left out of sight is the host. And, uh, and a big topic that we are currently working on is full stack at a station. So what you essentially want to do is you want to protect your complete environment and your silicon from the silicon up to the container, right? If we are looking at uh, various attacks that we currently have like PK fail where uh, most, many of the BIOS or firmware vendors are shipping uh, untrusted keys, meaning your secure boot is broken, your measured boot is broken, so essentially your UFI is already broken, right? And then on top of that, we are running the kernel, and your kernel is broken because we don't have proper measured boot. And then on, on top of, of that, um, in the operating system, since the UFI is broken, kernel is, op uh, is broken, your operating system is as well broken, right? So you have... Uh, the Ahoy attacks is, for example, a attack on CVMs where you can disrupt TEs uh, with malicious notification, which is uh, interrupt over flooding. So you, you can create a attack on CVMs if your host is, host is not protected, right? Um, I know there are a lot of eBPF tools uh, around there and uh, they're trying to protect the host, but the problem with, with that or any other tool that's, that's running on your Linux system is they're trying to ensure the integrity of the runtime on which they are depending on, right? So you have a cyclic dependency. Uh, you, cannot, you cannot protect the very same runtime that you're running in because if it's broken, you are broken. So an eBPF is more of a observability tool than a security tool. So just to, uh, to give you an impression, even if eBPF and all those uh, tools are working. Um, Kurt Gödel, it's a Austrian mathematician. Um, he, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the incompleteness theorem, but a sufficiently complex formal system. There are propositions and axioms in this system that you cannot be proven true or false. And that's the same that we can apply on the runtime, right? You have tools in your runtime, um, and any attempt to approve the integrity of the runtime environment within itself creates a circular dependency, as noted, right? And this makes it uh, impossible to establish absolute trust without relying on an external or a higher level uh, verification. So you cannot attest yourself, that, that's the point. And eBPF tries to attest itself, it, it tries to attest uh, the host, and that's not, that's not working. Mathematically, even if it's working, mathematically there's still propositions then you, you do that you cannot prove. Okay, how, how does, for example, the CSP are doing the uh, verification, how they are protecting uh, the runtime? 
So as I said before, it needs to be a out of box uh, solution, right? If you, are, as an example, I'm taking here AWS Nitro. So if you look at AWS Nitro, they are running those Nitro cards out of their host, right? They're, the host does not have any control about the Nitro cards. Uh, the flow is from the EC2 control plane to the Nitro cards, and from the Nitro cards, they're managing the Nitro hypervisor and essentially all the instances that you, that you, that you have on the host. So there's no back channel. Uh, the Nitro hypervisor cannot talk to the Nitro cards, and the Nitro cards cannot talk to the EC2 plane. So there's no way back to really to the uh, most powerful instances here. And um, I also showed here the ASICs and APROMs, right? So the other thing is, how can we protect also the ASICs? Uh, because a malicious attacker could reprogram our EE prompts and your ASICs are running a, a faulty code. What Nitro does is they have a service processor and they can hold their CPU and reset. And um, during this reset, the management uh, Nitro card is, is attesting and measuring all the EE prompts and uh, every ASIC has a, on the ISP swear bus, they have a hook there where can they measure their EEPROM and the firmware, and they can verify it with uh, gold measurements they have. So everything that's loaded from the EEPROM is checked by the Nitro card. So they're protecting the ASICs. And then on top of it, they have a TPM, meaning um, they can protect um, uh, the loaded hypervisor and uh, the CPU is holding reset until all those firmware uh, kernel, host kernel, host guest FS, uh, Nitro hypervisor, all the components are really verified. And it's always the same pattern, right, in its station. You measure something and compare it to uh, expected values. The host has no access to all of those um, functionalities. It's all out of bound. As I said before, it needs to be an out of bound or higher privilege um, entity to verify that the host running is, that the host is running in a, a genuine and an expected uh, state. So this is on the cloud, right? But if you're looking on on-prem, if you're interested how to do this on on-prem, there's a company called Oxide Computers. They are essentially doing the very same thing. They have a service processor that can hold the uh, CPU in, in reset. They have a root of trust, and you need a root of trust. You need to start uh, trusting some entity. And um, the root of trust is holding like all the keys and endorsement keys to protect uh, other secrets. and. Uh, as, as I said, service process, uh, processor holds the CPU in reset until all the measurements are done, until all firmware is checked and, and measured and attested, and only then the, the CPU is released and the CPU can then run on the host, create a hypervisor and do all the, all the other things uh, that we need. Um, they have some more features like secure secret storage, which is completely offloaded from the host, so you don't sharing any secrets on the host, so any workload running on the host will not have access to any, to any secrets. Right, with this out of band management and additional root of trust, uh, we kind of have green lights on the ASICs, on the EE prompts. Uh, we have now measured, measured boot, secure boot with UFI and kernel, uh, all backed up by, by the TPM. Uh, but still, we, we didn't solve any, anything on the host because measured boot stops when you have your Linux prompt running. Right? So what can we do additionally on the operating system uh, to prevent us, like as mentioned here, from the AI attacks. So one thing uh, is runtime integrity of the operating system. So there are tools like DM Verity and FS Verity. So essentially, those tools are building a Merkle tree. This is those are essentially hashes of hashes. So in the end, you have a hash or a fingerprint of your operating system of your file system uh, that you can uh, compare to expected value. And then we have the integrity measurement architecture of Linux and EVM. Uh, those essentially are also signed files, uh, crypto cryptographically measured files and metadata uh, that you can again compare to some expected values. Um, and then there are approaches like a immutable operating system, Red Hat Core is Ubuntu Core, so that you're just preventing, uh, have a own, a, that you're preventing um, accidental rights to your user uh, partition and stuff like that. And then, um, One problem we have with KVM and plus VMMs, be it QEMU, Cloud Hypervisor, uh, or, or other VMMs that are running, 
is uh, that they are sharing the very same kernel, right? Uh, that, that's the same, same problems we have with containers. That's why we are doing the sandboxing uh, at, at the first place. Uh, a breakout can still create a denial, denial of service on the other VMs. So if you're on a host, you can attack those other VMs. Uh, if you're running a confidential container, data is still encrypted, but you can still uh, kill off all those QEMU, like I kill all QEMU and then all the VMs are gone. So that's the problem. And that's uh, what we are looking also upstream is uh, to run Kata and confidential containers uh, with a type one hypervisor, right? Why do we need an operating system? Why do we need a full blown operating system running underneath our VM? We just need the VM management. The, the challenge that we have on CSP is they're providing us VMs. So uh, to run Kata confidential containers, we kind of need nested virtualization, but we also don't need it. Nested virtualization can introduce a lot of problems, security issues, performance issues. Um, so one way how to solve that is uh, to remove nested virtualization. Uh, so everybody who is familiar with Xen, Xen had uh, this primary VM and a secondary VM, and the primary VM was uh, managing all those user, user VMs on the same L1 level, so they are, do not have any nested virtualization. Um, it's a simpler, more simplified architecture. Uh, it flattens the virtualization hierarchy, so all VMs are running as L1 guests. We don't, have any, we don't need any L2 guests. Uh, more performance, we have more security gains, and of course we have uh, reduced uh, resource usage. O on the right side, uh, this is just an example. How, to, how could you accomplish this with the Acorn hypervisor? This is a modern type one hypervisor. Uh, similar model to Zen, you have a service VM which is doing all the resource management, uh, and you have then on the same level the, the user VMs. Um, and, and Free the Turtles is the reference to the Turtles project, uh, which introduced the concept of nested virtualization uh, in KVM. Right, and one, one implementation of, of this uh, secondary VM pattern is uh, confidential containers, peer pods. Um, essentially, you have a primary VM, which is the worker node on a CSP instance, right? And the pod is, is run in a own CSP VM instance, right? We are not doing the nested virtualization inside of the worker node. We have this peer VM, which is run as a own CSP instance. So we have decoupled the worker node from the workload and you can even, with this model, you can even com completely decouple the control plane from your worker node. You could, have con could run your control plane on-prem and have your worker node on the CSP and your workload on the CSP running. So the, you can decouple your workload from the worker node and you de can completely decouple it from your control plane, which enables us to uh, run confidential containers also as a hybrid, hybrid cloud, right? You can run your pod on-prem with the local VM uh, that you're running, and then burst out to the CSPs with, with peer pods. All completely transparent, lift and shift. The only interface is the pod, like in Kubernetes. You just change the runtime class uh, from peer pods to local VM or a Kata container. Right, so we have taken care of the ASICs, UFI, kernel, operating system. Um, yeah, I'm still having the operating system like as red because uh, if your CVM is misconfigured, you have SSH access to them, operating system can still go into your CVM, right? Um, so, threat model, what we are looking also is, yeah, we do not trust the guest as well because the confidential container runs inside of the guest VM and essentially the guest VM is only used to spin up the container to handle the life cycle of the container. So we essentially don't need a sophisticated or full-blown operating system in the, in the VM as well. Um, and all those artifacts that are running in the CVM, like the firmware, guest kernel, and guest FS are coming from the host. So if you, if you have a malicious host, he, he could provide malicious uh, artifacts for your CVM, so you're running um, a malicious code in there. Again, in, on the guest, we can do the runtime integrity as well. Uh, the very same tools that I mentioned before, DMR, DFS Verity, IMA, EVM, immutable OS. Um, and, but one big topic is, um, you know, if you're doing like the CQ boot, you have measurements, you have a TPM where you can uh, store your own protocol measurements um, in a hardware enclave. 
uh, if we are doing it in the guest, how we are protecting those measurements, because they could be manipulated and the attestation report could, uh, you know, give you wrong, uh, wrong measurements outside to the, to the attestation or to the remote attestation entities. Um, those runtime measurements um, can be protected via attestation inside of the CVM. Um, there are report fields in the attestation report, which you can extend. Uh, TDX has a RTMR, which is a runtime measurement register, which is essentially a TPM PCR uh, register where you can extend hashes. Um, but one thing uh, the community was looking into is how can we leverage uh, VTPMs, VTPMs in a, in a guest. Uh, obviously, we cannot pass through a VTPM from the host uh, because we do not trust the host and we would need to have a, we need to protect, if we are pass throughing a VTPM, uh, it need to be uh, a software implementation because you cannot virtualize a hardware TPM. Um, and if you are pass throughing a virtualized TPM from the host, you need to protect it somehow. You, you would need to run this as well in a, in a confidential enclave to protect it from the host or from other tenants that you're running. So one idea the community has, there are um, high privilege uh, firmware running inside of the CVMs. Uh, one is Coconut SVSM, and Microsoft recently announced OpenHCL, which is a high privilege firmware running in a special VM level. So uh, if you look at SMP, SMP can run, um, can run applications inside of the CM on different VM privilege levels. And uh, they're on privilege level zero, we are running this uh, custom hardware, which can emulate a VTPM. Privilege level one would run the kernel and privilege level two would run the operating system. And as, as higher you go, you have less and less privileges. So level two cannot access level one and level one cannot access level two. So the VTPM is protected from the kernel and from the, from the user space. Uh, VTPMs inside of CVMs are stateless. Uh, we, are not saving, we are not saving any state. Uh, but one topic is really how do you manufacture a TPM inside of a CVM because usually a hardware TPM is uh, manufactured with the endorsement key when it's built into the server. And with VTPMs, you need this to do on the fly. So if you're, if you're instantiating a VTPM, you're creating a endorsement key, you can bound this to the attestation report of the CPU and you have the certificate chain up to the uh, CPU vendor. So you prove that your endorsement key is valid and from there you can uh, derive storage keys and all the other TPM related stuff that you would do. Um, there are some discussions upstream because some of, the, some of the folks do not think that the TPM is the right interface to protect measurements inside of a CVM. So there are some discussions going on uh, on the kernel side, on the user space side, also in our community on Kubernetes containers, how to protect those measurements uh, correctly because as I said, TDX has RTMR, uh, SMP has, does not have something like that, uh, CCA is doing it completely different, and all other, other enclaves are having their own implementation. Right, as I said before, uh, the guest VM is just a deployment vehicle. We don't really need a full-blown operating system running there for the confidential containers use case. Um, what we're working on is on guest kernel hardening you know, just uh, stripping down all the options that we do not need. Uh, a distro-less guestFS only have the libraries and uh, some of the binaries that we need to lifecycle the, the container. Uh, we are not running a full-blown operating system. Uh, also firmware hardening, disabling, disabling features and parts that we do not need. Um, and then we have the container payload, right? Uh, one thing you could imagine, um, since we don't have any tools in the guestFS, uh, an attacker could use the container as a payload because the container is saved in the, in the VM and use those tools that he deployed via container inside of the VM. Uh, how we are protecting against this is using SLinux on app armor so that no container context can execute anything on, as in, in the host context. So you're uh, protecting the guest VM from running a container payload binary. So essentially we wanna create a void for the attacker without the possibility to enumerate anything or any lateral movement. As you see, I have uh, still a question mark on a container, right? We can sign the container, uh, verify that the container is coming from a registry that they're expecting of, but how do we know what the container is deploying, right? Well, what are the tools in there? What are the packages that you're running in there? Uh, and this is where SBOMS comes into play, right? We need an inventory of all those components that are running in our stack. Uh, we wanna know 
if we need to react on a CD or on a bug fix, uh, be it a container, be it a guest FS, or be in the operating system. So we are keeping track of the inventory, what is running on our stack, and uh, we are verifying all the signature of the S bombs, of the containers, of the firmware, guest kernels, all files that are needed there are signed and need to be, need to be attested. So essentially, what we want to do is verify all signature as bomb certificates via, via remote attestation. Right? We, need to build to, we need to build a chain of trust from the silicon up to the container as bomb. And only if all those parts are green, verified, and tested, we can say, okay, we are running a trusted stack. How are you doing attestation? Again, trustee is our attestation pipeline. We are extending uh, trustee to support all of these use cases that I currently uh, explained here. Um, the problem with uh, CSP attestation is that they are attesting themselves, right? So that's the problem. Um, usually you want to attest the environment where are you running as a workload owner. Uh, and that's where trustee comes into play, so you can deploy trustee on your trusted uh, infrastructure and then attest uh, your confidential containers workloads and uh, VTPM quotes and the S-bombs and the signature of all the complete stack. Right, and measure and attest every layer, trust only what you verify. Right, this comes then to cloud functions and why we are doing like the full stack attestation. Uh, running serverless because the cloud functions are running on a shared abstracted infrastructure where the underlying layers are hidden but crucial to security, right? Those points of use are from the cloud function provider, the function as a service provider, or from the workload uh, owner who is looking at that. We have opaque layers, right? We don't know anything about the hardware. We want to make sure that the hardware hypervisor operating system, all the artifacts that we are deploying are in a state that the user expects it and vice versa so that the user also expects that all the tools and artifacts and layers are protected so that uh, multi-tenancy is kind of possible because we want to also protect from other, multi uh, of other tenancies on the very same, very same um, hardware. Uh, resources are shared, right? We have potential for data leakage, malicious inferencing, denial of service between tenants. Uh, all the vulnerabilities in hardware or firmware can impact uh, function without the knowledge of the user who is running the cloud function or the infrastructure owner. Um, right, and uh, the last point is really, if, we, if the runtime or operating system or other layers are unmeasured, they can be tampered with impacting function integrity, data security. So measure everything, verify everything, attest everything, make sure that every layer of your stack is attested and uh, verifiable. Yeah, what's the last slide? Any questions? That's on our, on, on our roadmap, yeah. Update, yeah, that's a good, good point. You need, if you find a CV or bug, you need to update the guest kernel or the guest FS or any other parts of your firmware on the, on the, for the CVM, yeah. Uh, hello. You mentioned that one avenue for securing this would be the guest kernel wouldn't need to be a full-blown kernel. If we're running cloud functions with arbitrary workloads, don't we need... Yeah, you, you're hard to understand. I don't know why <laughs> the mic is so... When, when we're running um, the guest kernel, you mentioned one avenue for securing would be to run something less than that, just to run Kata agent, for example. Yeah, um, the Kata agent is running, yeah, but the, the, in the guest kernel, we don't need support like for all the file systems. We don't need support for the, all the uh, gazillion options that we have. It's really a stripped down guest kernel uh, with 20 to 30 options enabled. Wouldn't the, the workload need a full blown like Linux kernel for the workload? I'm making a syscall in my function container image, right? Well, we need to define what the full blown kernel is. No, it does not need all the options. So. We're stripping down, so yeah, we are testing all the workloads that are running on it, but we are disabling options that we don't really need. Gotcha, so that'd be something in our contract that we say, yeah, yeah. this is what we support. Right, so it's always the syscall interface between the workload and the kernel that you need to fortify, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you still, so a 
a vertical can still break out out of the container, right? But then you are on the on the guest VM, and that's where you're saying, okay, create a void if you are only on a type one hypervisor, or if you if you have a guest kernel which only has uh, some libraries and some binaries, you don't have a shell, you don't have any LS, you cannot enumerate anything. Uh, there's not much a, a attacker can do. Only what I mentioned before, having the container uh, dropping down the payload to have more tools, but then we are protecting it with SA Linux so that the container context cannot be run with the guest VM context. Thank you. Yeah, uh, one more question. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, during that, uh, you you do attestation against CSP. Uh, yeah. But I think, if I'm not mistaken, it's possible to uh, run attestation against um, the chip manufacturer. Uh, Can you say it again? It's it's really hard to understand the mic. I don't know what's what's happening. <laughs> uh, I think it's um, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, it's possible to uh, do attestation against the chip manufacturer. Like if you have Intel's chip, then uh, you can attest against the uh, services running in Intel, right? Yeah. If you have a, a SGI chip, for example. Yeah. So is that possible to mitigate that issue using uh, attestation against the uh, chip manufacturer and not a CSP? That, does that make sense? The Oh yeah, you're asking attestation against a CPU manufacturer. Yeah, yeah, that's what we are doing. Yeah, yeah. So we, we are we are testing against this uh, CPU uh, if you're running SMP against AMD, right? And we are using the AMD certificates change, right? On a CSP, you can do that, right? You can use trustee on a CSP to attest the AMD CPU. You don't need to use the CSP's uh, attestation services because in the end, you don't know what what they are running and how they are doing it. Hi. Hi. Uh, so this might be a very naive question, but in GCP, if we are running serverless functions, yeah. how do we do the attestation uh, with trustee? Like, how does that work? Uh, that, that, that's a good question. Uh, my main focus is on-prem, where we have control over everything. That's a completely different uh, discussion with CSPs, right? I cannot answer that. All right. Thank you. Make well. The, the, at least once you have your CVM, you can attest all those things that you're running in the CVM, right? Your, your workloads or your, your runtime measurements that you're doing. You're, you can still do your runtime integrity on a CVM. You are responsible for the operating system, right? After the CVM boots up, you are responsible for those stuff and you can attest those other stuff. But on the, the underlying parts, that's a CSP thing. So you need to think about. Well, you can attest the CPU, right, without the CSP. Any other questions? Once, twice. Thank you all for listening.